want to welcome you to again to our class, Understanding the End Times. This is session seven, the four empires revealed by Daniel. And so what we're going to do today in this session is we're going to look at Daniel chapter two and Daniel chapter seven at the four empires that Daniel revealed. And if you think about it, one of the most amazing things that happened in Daniel chapter two, and this might even be one of the greatest miracles in the Bible is Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was said, told everyone in his kingdom, I had a dream and all the people and all the magicians and people who interpreted dreams, they, you know, you've heard the story, but they were coming in and oh, we can interpret for you. We can interpret for you. But Daniel, but the king said, no, I am not looking for you to tell me an interpretation because anyone can make up an interpretation. I want you to tell me the exact dream I had and the interpretation. If you think about how crazy and bizarre dreams are, you know, okay, that, that would be almost an impossible task. But Daniel said, I can do it. And so Daniel goes into prayer, and God not only reveals the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but he reveals to him the actual dream Nebuchadnezzar has, which to me is an incredible miracle. I mean, it's a stunning miracle that he is able to be able to do that. And so in Daniel chapter 2 and in Daniel chapter 7, what we have are four major empires that God has used and will use to refine, purify, and purge and prepare the nation of Israel. Now, we saw in the uh, previous session in, uh, Daniel, in uh, Daniel 70 weeks, Daniel 9, 24 through 27, we saw that there was a six-fold purpose for the nation of Israel that would be accomplished over a time period of 490 weeks, or 490 years, 70 times 7. We talked about that in the last session. Now, in this session, what we're going to see is we're going to begin to uncover the actual empires God used to accomplish the six-fold purpose we saw in the last sessions. That's what we're going to look at. So... In Daniel chapter 2, what Daniel is, he gets the dream. He actually sees the very dream Nebuchadnezzar has, and he sees a, a statue. And, the, and I'm sure you've read it before, but if you haven't, definitely read Daniel chapter 2. And in this, in this uh, vision, this dream Daniel has, is he sees a head of gold. And he tells Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. Babylon is the head of gold. And he sees... Uh, arms and chest of silver, a, a mid area of bronze, and then he sees iron. And he, as he goes through it, you can tell clearly, okay, Media Persia is the silver. Babylon's the gold. Media Persia, or the Persian Empire, is the silver. Uh, Greece is the bronze. And then there would be the Iron Kingdom, which many scholars believe is the Roman Empire that came after the Greek Empire. And then in Daniel chapter 7... Daniel sees four beasts, and he sees, a, he sees a lion that has eagle's wings on it, but the eagle's wings are plucked up one by one. He sees a bear with a, with, a, uh, with a command given to that bear saying, Arise and devour much meat. He sees a leopard that has four wings and four heads on it. And uh, then, he, then he sees an iron monster with teeth, and which he said it was so different from all the other beasts, and it had ten, uh, ten horns on it. And so, anyway, most scholars, most conservative scholars throughout history, and you can see it in your notes on page one, uh, this, uh, this chart of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, is most scholars believe the first kingdom is Babylon, which is represented by the gold and the, and the lion in terms of the two visions. Uh, the second one is Media Persia, and it's represented by the silver and the bear. The third one is Greece, which is represented by bronze and a leopard. And then the fourth one is the Roman Empire. Uh, and I, and I, if you've seen there, I put a question mark because some are, there's been some debate lately whether it's the Roman Empire or not. And I'm going to go into that in this session. So I'll put Rome as a question mark with iron and then the iron monster. So... We'll get into that in this session, whether it's Rome or whether it could be perhaps another empire such as the Ottoman Empire or the British Empire or any of those other things that people have said or claimed. So anyway, um, just one other note before we get too far into this 
is some people say Daniel chapter 2 reveals Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, but Daniel chapter 7 actually are modern day empires, and some think it's the lion and the eagle is Eng England and America, the bear is Russia, the leopard is um, Germany or whatever, and I, I just don't think that's, uh, that's true. The, the, a couple of reasons why. First of all, is when Daniel saw the lion with eagle's wings, that is, and in the, in the eagle's wings were plucked out one by one. The lion with eagle's wings, that was actually a symbol of Babylon in that time. And it was, it was symbolic of Nebuchadnezzar. Because of his pride, God humbled Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, he, he went mad for seven years. I'm sure you know the story. He went mad for seven years, and then God finally restored him when he realized the God of heaven is the one that gave him the kingdom in the first place. Uh, the, sec the, the second thing I, I would say is the, the leopard with the four heads and the four wings. I mean, that's clearly representing Greece. When Alexander the Great, he, he came onto the scene for about a decade, and he had incredible military success, probably some of the most uh, successful military campaigns in history. But at the height of his power, I think at the age of, I think at 30 is what I think it was, at the, at the age of 30, Alexander the Great died suddenly, and then uh, over a period of years, his successors fought for dominion over that territory that he had conquered. And that was symbolized by, by the uh, leopard with four heads. And so that's why I believe when we look at Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, that Daniel is seeing the same empires and he's seeing them from a different lens. One in a statue, the other through beast. And so... Uh, you know, just to, just to clarify where we're coming at from this. And so what we're going to do first is we're going to go through real quick, we're going to look at what Daniel said about the first three empires, Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece. And then we're going to get into the fourth one, Rome, and say, okay, is this the Roman Empire or is it perhaps another empire that, uh, that Daniel was talking about? So... Um, just starting here is we'll, we'll start with Babylon as Daniel told him and uh, in Daniel 2 verse 31 through 32 if you have your Bibles you can go ahead and turn to Daniel chapter 2 as Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar he said you O king were looking and behold there was a single great statue and that statue which was large and of extraordinary splendor was standing in front of you and its appearance was awesome the head of that statue was made of fine gold. And he, he finally tells him, he goes on to tell him, and he begins to interpret the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, now the interpretation is, verse 36, before the king is, you, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the fields, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand, and he has caused them to rule over all. You are the head of gold. And so what we know clearly just from that, Babylon, the Babylonian Empire, some call it the Neo-Babylon Empire, is the Babylonian Empire is the head of gold. Is, that is the head of gold that Daniel saw in his dream. Then, you know, some years later, just prior to uh, Babylon's fall, is Daniel in Daniel chapter 7, he has a dream and he sees, just like we, we said earlier, he sees four great beasts coming up from the sea. And these four great beasts, they're different from one another. And the first beast Daniel saw was a lion with eagle's wings that were plucked out. And it was, it was lifted up from the ground, made to stand on two feet like a man. And a mo human mind was also given to it. And many scholars, and I believe this as well, believe that that was actually talking about Nebuchadnezzar and his humbling for seven years. And so Daniel sees that there. And so the, the Babylonian Empire or the Neo-Babylonian Empire lasted from 626 B.C. until 539 B.C., and Nebuchadnezzar became the greatest king of that empire, of that kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar was the greatest empire, or greatest king of that empire. And, and if, you, if you know the history of Babylon, Babylon just conquered basically the whole Middle East. In fact, if you have your notes, if you're looking on your notes, on page two, you see a map of the new Babylonian empire. And the empire stretched from about the border of Egypt into the Sinai Peninsula all the way into modern-day Iraq and Babylon being the headquarters of that. 
They just cut right across the heart of the Middle East, including uh, Israel in 587 B.C. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon just destroyed Israel, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, took the Jewish people captives into Babylon where they served in captivity for seven years, 70 years, which we talked about in the last session. I'm sure you're familiar with that. But anyway, that's the Babylonian Empire. That is the Babylon Empire. The second empire that Daniel mentioned in Daniel 2 and in Daniel chapter 7 is the Media Persia, or what a lot of people refer to as just the Persian Empire. Both are the same thing. But in Daniel 2, Daniel said uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, he said, the breast and the arms were silver. And he said later, he said in uh, Daniel 2, 39, he said, after you, talking to Nebuchadnezzar, after you, another kingdom will arise which is inferior to you. And so it's inferior to you, meaning that, that uh, another kingdom would come which is inferior to you, and that's represented by the silver. And so then in Daniel chapter 7, the bear is what is symbolic of the media Persian empire, where, where Daniel saw the bear, he said in verse 5, Daniel 7, verse 5, Daniel saw this bear raised up on one side, three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth, and as Daniel gazed at the bear, he heard the command to the bear, Arise, devour much meat. And uh, you can see in, uh, on page three in your notes, the, 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 the Persian Empire was much greater in scope and size than the Babylonian Empire. And, you know, we've heard a lot about Cyrus, Cyrus the Great recently. And Cyrus the Great began his great military campaign conquering uh, conquering this large por portions of the Middle East, even in down into India, and so finally, that the apex of at the apex of the empire of Persia stretched from all the way from Egypt all the way into Iran and into some parts of India, and so it's just a massive empire that the Persian Empire was. And if so you, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the Persian Empire. If you've read the scriptures, you know Daniel, or you know that in, uh, after the Daniels, uh, or after the 70 weeks of uh, captivity in Daniel, or in Jeremiah talked about, is that Cyrus released the Jews from Babylon and, and gave them permission to go back and rebuild the, the temple. And then what we talked about in the last session, Artaxerxes gave two decrees one to rebuild the temple, the other to rebuild Jerusalem. And so the Persian Empire was the empire that helped uh, Israel be rebuilt and or Jerusalem be rebuilt, the temple be rebuilt. Um, also Esther, you know, read, you read the book of Esther. Esther was actually the, became the queen of the Persian Empire. So anyway, I, I recommend that you look at the notes, you look at the maps in the notes. These maps really do help us get a picture of the massive territory the Persian Empire occupied. And this is going to become really important when we try to identify, okay, where is the end time empire going to mainly be located? Because the, if you notice, there, there's, a common, there's a commonality in the land that's occupied in these different kingdoms. And so we can look at that and say, okay, based on this, we know also that the in time empire, the one the Antichrist will arise out of, will also be primarily located in these areas. And we'll get into that in, in later for sure, showing about that. The third empire is Greece. And uh, I think I mentioned this in the last session, but Daniel so accurately predicted which empires would rise up that many critics and scholars said, okay, there's no way you know, they don't believe in miracles, but there's no way someone could so accurately predict these empires. And so some said, well, he didn't write Daniel in um, 539 B.C. or whatever. He wrote, he wrote Daniel in the second century after all these empires had come to pass. And we know that's not true, but that's how accurate Daniel was in his prophecy. That's how accurate he was in his prophesying is that Daniel was able to see so accurately the empires that would rise up. And so, anyway, that's the third kingdom of, uh, is, is the kingdom of Greece. And so Daniel 2, 39, uh, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, after you there will rise another kingdom inferior to you, then a third kingdom of bronze. So Greece is the third kingdom of bronze. And this kingdom will rule over the, the whole earth. Now, 
you, we know that it did not rule over the entire earth. We know that Daniel's talking about the then known world. And even then he didn't rule over every single part of the then known world, but it ruled the, uh, the Greece, the Greek empire ruled over a massive, even greater than the Persian empire. In fact, Alexander the Great conquered the Persian Empire and took over the very land they were ruling over, but it expanded even greater than the Persian Empire. And so Alexander the Great is, is many historians know Alexander the Great as one of the most brilliant and successful military commanders in history. And so for 10 years, I mean, Alexander rises to the top at the age of 20. I mean, I can't even imagine 20 years old and you're conquering massive territory of land from Greece all the way into Iran. And so for 10 years, uh, Alexander the Great was on this mission to conquer uh, much of the Middle East and uh, even, in, even parts of Europe, um, in Greece, and in, in especially in Greece, because it was out of Greece. And so anyway, on page four here, you can see the, uh, the map that Alexander the Great, his empire uh, conquered, and it basically conquered the Persian Empire, plus added other parts, especially in Greece. And so when Daniel saw, in Daniel chapter 7, when Daniel saw the leopard, and it had, this leopard had four heads and four wings on its back, it so accurately predicted uh, what would happen. But the leopard was a beautiful example of Alexander the Great, because, you know, just a leopard, it can run like 30 five miles per hour, 36 miles per hour. It can jump 20 feet forward. It can jump 10 feet up. And so it, this, this represents exactly what uh, Alexander the Great did over a 10-year period. He was like a leopard with swiftness. He conquered every one of his enemies, an incredible military success, and conquered so much of the of territory in the Middle East and even into Greece and all the way into Iran. But then... At a very young age, Alexander died, and he didn't designate a successor. And so for a, a period of time, there was these wars and conflicts known as the wars of Alexander's successors. And they, they, they were waging war over who would conquer which empire or which part of land. And there were these different series of wars that took place. And that's accurately represented in the uh, leopard with four wings and four heads. His dominion was given to four of Alexander's generals who won their battles. And you can see on page five in our notes, you can see that the, the four different empires that Alexander's successors conquered and had dominion over. So you can see that right there in their notes. And so that's, that's where, that's Daniel's vision so far, the Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece. And so now we get to the fourth empire. And so... You know, just if you look at history, if you look at um, commentaries and things like that, most scholars, most conservative scholars believe that the fourth empire of iron, the iron, the iron in the statue that Daniel saw, even the iron with the ten toes mixed with clay, and then the iron monster in Daniel 7, most conservative scholars have said that has to be the Roman Empire. And, you know... Just to be honest, in my studies, when I first started studying this, I said, okay, that, I just thought, okay, that is the Roman Empire. And then, you know, probably, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago or so, I started questioning, okay, is that really the Roman Empire? Is, it, is, is that really uh, Rome that's going to be restored? Is the revived Roman Empire really what the scripture is saying? And some have said, no, the fourth empire is actually the Ottoman Empire. And so, I, you know, just to be honest, I went through a, a time where I was really wrestling with this issue off and on for, I don't know, a period of five years or so, just really praying, okay, Lord, show me the truth. I just don't want to accept what uh, conservative commentaries say. I don't want to accept anything. You know, I just kind of was searching for the answer. Okay, Lord, is it Rome? Is it Ottoman Empire? Is it just the end time empire, maybe not connected to Rome? Just trying to search through that to try to really work through those things. And so anyway, after, after just spending a lot of time in prayer about this issue, I, I do believe, in my opinion, it is the Roman Empire. And I'm going to share with you why I believe that. Um, before I get there, though, I want to, I want to read Daniel 7, 17 through 23. Um, I'm not going to read the whole section there, but I want to highlight this, this passage of Scripture. 
is Daniel 7, 17 through 23 says that these great beasts, which are four in number, are, listen to what it says, are four kings who will arise from the earth. Then you go down to, I think about verse 23, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth. So Daniel's telling us is these beasts uh, that he sees in Daniel 7, and I would say also the, the uh, different elements in the statue in Daniel 2, these are not only um, kings, but they are also kingdoms. So these are used in interchangeably. And so the king would be the greatest example and the embodiment of that kingdom. So Nebuchadnezzar is the, is the king that best represented Babylon. Alexander the Great or Cyrus would be the, the king that best represented Persia. And then Alexander the Great would be the king that would best represent uh, Greece or whatever. And so it, it, the, this shows us that in this particular passage of Scripture, kings and kingdoms can be used interchangeably. This will be important as we get into the book of Revelation. And we see in Revelation 17 that, that these, are, these seven mountains are seven kings and or seven kingdoms. They're used interchangeably. So just keep that in mind as we get further in this teaching. Okay, so why I believe the three empires, or why I believe, sorry, why I believe, uh, three reasons why I believe the uh, fourth empire is the Roman Empire. Number one is the first three empires were in consecutive order. So you had Babylon. Persia conquered Babylon. Uh, then came Greece, Greece conquered Persia, and then came Rome, Rome conquered Greece. And so it just makes sense to me, following that very same pattern of the other three, that the fourth would be also Rome, because Rome conquered the Greek, the Greek Empire in 146 BC and then established dominion over the then, the then, the then known world. So that, that makes sense to me. It's just the same pattern that the other three have followed, therefore it makes sense Rome is the fourth empire. Number two, this to me is a no-brainer, but it, it is, would be hard to imagine the Lord writing Scripture and leaving out the empire under which Jesus was both born and crucified. I mean, I can't imagine that, that Jesus, that uh, I can't imagine that uh, the Lord would leave that out of this particular passage of Scripture that he would not even include the empire where his son was born and crucified. So that for me is like, okay, it, it makes a lot more sense for it to be Rome than other, some other empire when his son was born and crucified. Number three is, and this one is a big one as well, but these empires are directly related to the Jewish people living in Israel, um, the Jewish people occupying the city of Jerusalem and the Jewish people performing temple sacrifices. And so we said it in the last session. That's why I wanted you to make a, a very clear note. Daniel 9, 24 through 27, that sixfold purpose God listed for the nation of Israel is carried out and executed by four world empires. Very important. So that sixfold purpose is carried out by four worldwide empires that would specifically refine, purify, purge, prepare, judge the nation of Israel. And so um, if, you, if you think about it, that is the, in my opinion, that's the criteria and the key to identifying these four world, these four world empires is they are directly related to the Jewish people living in Israel directly related to the Jewish people occupying Jerusalem, and uh, they're directly related to the Jewish people performing temple sacrifices. Because if you remember in Daniel 9, that passage we looked at, Daniel, the Lord, Gabriel told Daniel, he said, this, this prophecy is related to your people and the city of Jerusalem. And they're, they're specifically Jerusalem-centric. When the Jewish people were living in the, the, the nation of Israel and occupying the city of Jerusalem. And so, if you think about it, if you think about it, if we take Babylon, Greece, or Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece, if you take these three empires and look, okay, do these three empires have a relationship, a, a uh, specific relationship to the Jews, 
living in Israel, occupying Jerusalem, performing temple sacrifices. Can we see that pattern? And then if so, then that also shows us that the fourth empire should, should follow that very same pattern. So yes, uh, we can see that. If you look at uh, 586 BC, when the Jewish people dwelt securely in the land of Israel, then Nebuchadnezzar goes and invades, just like the prophet said, goes and invades Israel by 587 BC. They, they take control of Judea, they conquer the city of Jerusalem, they, they, they destroy the temple, they take the Jewish people captive into the land of Israel. So we see that Babylon invaded Israel when the Jews lived in Israel, when they occupied Jerusalem, and when they were performing temple sacrifices. Second, we see, we see again the relationship between these empires and the Jews living in Israel, Jerusalem, and the temple sacrifices. So, for example, this is what I mean, is, in, is the Jewish people are in Babylonian captivity and Cyrus gives the first decree and he says you can be released to go forth from Babylon and you can rebuild your temple. And then Artaxerxes came and gave two other commands. You can go back and rebuild the temple and you can go back and rebuild Jerusalem. So it was through the Persian Empire that God allowed the Jews to return back to Israel to occupy again the city of Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. And then we look at the Greek Empire after the death of Alexander the Great. And so what we have seen is that Alexander the Great's empire was divided into four different areas, four different regions. And one of these kingdoms was the Seleucid Empire that eventually, you've probably heard of Antiochus Epiphanes who came to the throne in 175 B.C., but most scholars look at Antiochus Epiphanes as one of the greatest models and greatest prototypes of the Antichrist in history. And it was Antiochus Epiphanes who comes into Jerusalem, he persecutes the Jewish people, he, uh, he uh, outlaws Judaism, he bans the daily Jewish sacrifice, he even sacrifices a pig on the altar. And so many scholars look at Antiochus Epiphanes and they say he is a an incredible prototype and model of the Antichrist who is to come. And so once again, we see when, when Antiochus Epiphanes comes against Israel as that model and forerunner of the Antichrist, we see the Jews are living in Jerusalem, or living in Israel, they're occupying Jerusalem, and they're performing temple sacrifices. And so given these three things, now we can look at and say, okay, Ro the Roman Empire absolutely meets these three criteria because it was under the Roman Empire when they designated Herod, Herod the Great, or yeah, Herod, king of Judea, and he built the, the second temple. It took like 46 years to build, but it became one of the known wonders of the world. That's the very temple the Roman army destroyed in 70 AD. So here we have in about 70 AD, the Jewish people are living in Jerusalem. They're, they're occupying Jerusalem, living in Israel. They're performing temple sacrifices. And then the Roman Empire comes and they burn the temple to the ground, exactly like Jesus said in Matthew 24. They will not leave one stone unturned. They, they, will, they, they will burn the temple to the ground. And, and so we know what happened is they found out there was gold in the uh, temple, and so they, uh, lusting after money and control and their hatred of the Jewish people, they burned the temple to the ground. And so, just in summary here, is Babylon attacked Jerusalem, took the Jews captive, and destroyed the temple. Media Persia permitted Jerusalem to be rebuilt allowed the Jews to return to Judea and reauthorized the reconstruction of the temple. Greece, through Antiochus Epiphanes, invaded Jerusalem, persecuted the Jews, and, and defiled the temple with an abomination. And then we also see Rome. Rome attacked Jerusalem, killed over a million Jews, and burned the temple to the ground. And so there's this common denominator of these four things. And so that's why these three reasons. That's why I, I believe that the fourth empire that Daniel sees, that iron empire and the statue, and then the iron empire, the monster he sees in Daniel chapter 7, that he's talking about the Roman empire. And so, again, I would, uh, I would recommend if you look, have your notes to turn to page 7 and just take a good look of the large, the massive area of land the Roman empire occupied. And uh, you get an idea of how 
the, the empire of the last, the end of the age will look like, the Antichrist empire. You get an idea of the territory of land that this empire will, will take over and occupy. And so, anyway, so, you know, having said that, now let me talk about why I believe there's going to be a revived Roman empire. And so you've probably heard that. In fact, if you've ever, ever read prophecy books or heard prophecy teachings or done any kind of study in the book of Daniel, you've heard of the term revived Roman Empire. And I just want to explain just for a minute why I believe uh, we're going to see a revived Roman Empire. And so to me, if you look at that, if you, when, you, when you think about this question is why is there going to be a revived Roman Empire? I'm going to answer that question by turning to Revelation chapter 17. Let's go ahead and turn in our scriptures to Revelation chapter 17. And I'm going to answer that question for us. Revelation 17, if you think about Revelation 17, it is, it is one of the most complex parts of Scripture in the entire Bible. But, you know, I, I don't want to let that intimidate you, but it is, it's taken me years to really, really understand Revelation 17 and 18. I mean, I've spent uh, so many hours reading Revelation 17 and 18, reading commentaries about Revelation 17 and 18, listening to videos and audios and teachings. It's like, okay, what does this mean? What's this talking about? But I think if you, if you look at Revelation 17 and 18 and you come into this, now this is as important, as you come into Revelation 17 and 18 and you bring into these two chapters, which by the way, Revelation 17 and 18 are the longest prophecies in the New Testament. They're the longest prophecy in the book of Revelation and in the New Testament, one of the longest in Scripture. And so I think it tells us, okay, this is a really significant part of Scripture that we have to understand. And when we come to Revelation 17 and 18, we've got to realize that we've got to carry into this particular part of Scripture. We've got to carry into this what we learned in Daniel 2 and in Daniel chapter 7. We've got to carry into Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. We've got to carry into... The fact of these four empires we've already identified, um, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And we've got to carry into that Daniel 9, 24 through 27. We've got to carry that into Revelation 17 and 18 to understand exactly what we're seeing. And so this two-chapter prophecy, Dan John's gazing and he's looking and he sees a vision and in this vision, he sees a voluptuous harlot, and I'm sure you've read it. He's, this harlot is sitting on a scarlet beast, and this scarlet beast has, has ten heads, or no, sorry, seven heads and ten horns. And she's, he's looking at the harlot, and she's got a golden cup full of abominations. And the harlot is, you know, voluptuously dressed in, in purple and scarlet and adorned with precious pearls. And on her forehead is written the name Babylon the Great, the, the mother of harlots and of all the abominations of the earth. And John looks at her and he's like, what on the, in the world am I looking at right now? I mean, you can imagine looking at that. And, and, he, and he's like, you know, the angel looks, you know, looks at John and says, you know, why are you wondering, John, what you're seeing? I'm going to tell you the mystery of this woman who rides the beast. I'm not only going to tell you the mystery of this woman, but I'm going to tell you about the beast that carries her. And in fact, what you're going to find out is you really cannot understand the woman until you understand the beast. And that, and, and that revelation is, becomes very clear in Revelation 17 and 18. They're, the two are tied hand in hand. And you can't understand one if you don't understand the other. And so John looks and uh, sees this. And so... In Revelation 17, verse 8, John is, is wondering, gazing on this vision, and he's like, what does this mean? And the angel comes and tells John, he says, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth, whose name is not written in the book of life and the foundation of the world, they'll wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Verse 9, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. Five have fallen, and he's talking about in history. Five in, in history have fallen. Now remember what we saw earlier in Daniel 7 where I said kings and kingdoms can be used interchangeably. 
You could read this. That's going to be the same thing that's happening here is uh, five, five kings or kingdoms, kings and kingdoms, have already fallen. One is, which at the time of this writing was the Roman Empire, and the other has not yet come. When he comes, he must remain a little while, or he must, really what it's saying, he must rule for a short time. He must rule for a short time. And then verse 11, the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is out of the seven or one of the seven, which actually in the Greek it means out of the seventh, and he goes to destruction. That's a mouthful. So what are we seeing right here is, is most conservative scholars who, bre who believe in premillennial uh, interpretation, they don't believe in preterism, most conservative scholars believe that John is seeing, when he sees the seven heads, he's seeing, the, he's seeing uh, seven historical kingdoms. And again, remember what we learned in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, is these specific empires are, are related to the Jewish people and have a unique place in the Jewish people, Israel's history. And so most conservative scholars look at this and say, okay, the first empire is Egypt. The second one is Assyria. The third one would then carry us over to where Daniel is in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 is Babylon. The fourth one, Media Persia. The fifth one is Greece. The sixth uh, head that he saw is the Roman Empire, which at that time was in place when John wrote this. The seventh one, uh, the seventh one, it says specifically, it will rule or it will be in place for a short time. And I think that's very important because when we're trying to figure out, okay, you know, like for example, is this the Ottoman Empire? Uh, is the seventh kingdom the Ottoman Empire? Well, John tells us right here, the angel tells John, is that this seventh empire will only be in place for a short time. Whereas the Ottoman Empire was in place for like 500 something years, this says it's a short time. So we're talking 10, 15, 20 years, a couple decades, three decades. We don't know exactly how long the seventh kingdom is going to be. That's why I believe the seventh kingdom is, not, is a kingdom that has not yet come into be, is coming into place. It is a future end time kingdom. In fact, I believe this kingdom is rising up even as we speak. And then the next thing that happens is, if you actually look into the Greek, it says, uh, talking about this, this empire, it says there's also an eighth one. There, there's not only a seventh one, but there's also an eighth one. And that this one comes out of seven. That's what it actually means in the Greek. It comes out of seven. It means out of the seventh kingdom comes the eighth kingdom. That's a big key in looking at how to interpret these things is the eighth kingdom comes out of the seventh kingdom. Hopefully you're still with me. I know it's a lot of information. And so... I, you know, it's probably helpful not only to hear this a couple times and actually get into the notes and study and stuff like that, but it's also, it's important to realize that uh, just to process some of this stuff. And I, I've been thinking about this for years, praying about this for years, so if you're hearing this for the first time, it might be a little overwhelming, but I, I want to tell you, we're, we're going to make it really, really simple, and you'll see that in a minute, but just don't get overwhelmed with some of the details you might see. So, um, what we see, what, what I believe, and we'll, this will become clear in a minute, but what I believe we're going to see is in Revelation 17 and 18, we see the seventh kingdom, and then in Revelation 13, we see the eighth kingdom. And the Antichrist is going to be the, the perfect embodiment and the king of both kingdoms. Now, there will probably be other leaders in the seventh kingdom before the Antichrist. We'll talk about that later. But the Antichrist will be the greatest embodiment of what this kingdom is, both in the seventh and in the eighth kingdom. And if you read Revelation 13, you can see this is what the eighth kingdom looks like. If you read Revelation 17 and 18, you can see this is what the seventh kingdom looks like. And so in the, in the, we'll get into more of that in a minute. Okay, so now let's try to identify now the seventh kingdom. Who is the seventh kingdom? And, you know, like I mentioned before, it says specifically the seventh kingdom has to be in power for a short time, which means that the seventh kingdom, in my opinion, cannot be the Ottoman Empire, which was in place for 500 years. It has to be in place for a short time. And so 
You know, just to be honest, I mentioned this earlier, Revelation 17 and 18 is one of the most complex parts of Scripture I've ever read. It is something that you read and you're like, what is he talking about? I would encourage every one of you who are listening to spend some time reading Revelation 17 and 18. And you're like, why would I do that? You know, well, it's because it is the book of Revelation itself is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if the Lord spends two chapters in the revelation of Jesus Christ talking about Revelation 17 and 18, it tells us, okay, this is pretty important for us to understand. And especially if we're living at the end of the age, it's vital that we understand Revelation 17 and 18. And so as I've really just spent so many, so many years studying and trying to get, okay, what is this talking about? The, the range of interpretations is vast. I mean, you, you, you look at it, it's, it's vast, the range of interpretations that are out there. I mean, you know, throughout history, people looked at the, 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 the harlot as the woman riding the beast. This woman is, is either Rome or Islam or the Roman Catholic Church, which is a big, a lot of people think it's the Roman Catholic Church. Modern day teachers think that uh, she might be New York City or the United Nations or modern day Jerusalem. That's another big one. A, a literal rebuilt Babylon in Iraq. Apostate Christianity. You know, a lot of people say it's the Harlot Church or the Illuminati or even Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And so, really, it's like, you know, there's a lot of confusion about Revelation 17 and 18. And. Uh, to help us try to sort through the clutter and the, all the different views and interpretations, I, I, th there's about five criteria we've got to look at and to identify the woman in Revelation 17 and 18 is number one is this, the harlot is a real city. Okay, we've got to understand that the harlot is a real city. And this will eliminate some of the uh, options for interpretation. Um, and so just to say this, as we go through identifying the seventh kingdom, which I believe is in Revelation 17 and 18, it's also going to answer the question of why there will be a revived Roman Empire. Okay, keep that in mind. That's why we're doing it. The seventh kingdom is going to, identifying the seventh kingdom is going to answer the question of why there will be a revived Roman Empire. So keep that in mind. Just don't lose focus. There's so much detail going on, it's easy to lose the forest for the trees. So the, number one, the harlot is a real city. The harlot is a real city. And so you read Revelation 7, 18, uh, 17, 18, the Lord, Revelation 17, verse 18, the angel tells John, the woman whom you saw is the great city. Then you see different verses I have in the notes. Revelation 18.10, verse 18.16, some other ones. You see over and over, she's the great city. It's bottom line, the harlot must be a literal city. She cannot be spiritualized or allegorized or become a metaphor for something else. It is a literal city. So therefore, the harlot as a literal city cannot be the apostate church or hidden cabal of elites, or Islam. It is a literal city in the earth. The second thing we see is the harlot is a port city. And so if you read in Revelation 18, 17 through 18, is there's, there's people, there's uh, shipmasters on the ocean, and when the harlot Babylon, that city is set on fire, those shipmasters are looking at that city some miles into the ocean, looking on to the land, and they say, oh, the harlot, that, or they didn't call it the harlot, oh, the beloved city, that one who was making us wealthy, and they mourn over her. In other words, they, that this city must be located close to the ocean so that those in ships in the ocean could look on and see this harlot city on fire. So that's another criteria we got to look at from here in Revelation 17 and 18. Number three is the harlot is a city that exports false religion to the nations. Any Bible student knows that this harlot is not a real, literal harlot whom kings are giving money to for sex. That's not what is going on here. It's a symbol, it's a metaphor that this city 
is a harlot. And as you have studied scripture, you know that a harlot in scripture, especially in the Old Testament, is often portrayed, you know, you see it in the prophets over and over, is that, that Israel played the harlot, or you have, har you, you have become a harlot and you have committed adultery against me. It's a way to express idol worship or worshiping a false god or worshiping in a false religion. Uh, in the days of Israel, it's worshiping Baal and Asherah. It's worshiping the queen of heaven, worshiping other gods. And so the harlot is a, not only is from this city, this city is a harlot. This city is exporting idolatry into the nations, idol worship into the nations, a false religion into the nations. And so it leads millions of people astray. It actually says that, that this woman, this harlot, this harlot is making the world drunk with her immorality. This harlot is making the merchants of the earth rich. This harlot is making the kings uh, of the earth, uh, they, they commit fornication with her. So she sits on many waters, which are nations and tongues and people. It means her influence goes across the entire world. Her religion is exported. Her harlotry of religion is exported to the nations. Number four, the harlot is a world-renowned city. So what we see here, the harlot is a world-renowned city, as we see in Revelation 17 and 18, is that the woman is described as a great city, but all the people of the earth, when she's burning with fire, they look upon her and they go, no, no, the beloved city is on fire. The harlot's on fire. They didn't call it the harlot. They called it the beloved city. But the city we love is on fire. And they were just grieved and saddened and just overwhelmed with loss because the city they love so much is burning and on fire. So it's a world-renowned city. And then number five, the harlot is responsible for the murder of countless Christians throughout history. That's a big one right there. The harlot is responsible for the murder of countless Christians throughout history. John 17, 6, John said, I saw the woman and she was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the witnesses, the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. She was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. Revelation 17, 6. She's, she's drunk by the blood of those that she has killed and she's responsible for killing. He also wrote in Revelation 18, 4, is in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints. Revelation 19, 2, it says, of the final judgment of harlot Babylon, the heaven rejoices and proclaims and says, God has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. Revelation 19, 2. And so clearly the harlot city is responsible for murdering innum innumerable Christians throughout history, masses of Christians throughout history have been murdered by the harlot. So with all these, diff with all these five criteria in mind, let me explain why I believe that Rome is this harlot city. Is, uh, first of all, just before we even get into that, if you read Revelation 17 and 18, and, and I want to give credit to P.J. Hanley who help me understand this in his, one of his books on the end times. And I, I just, it sounds crazy, but it just, you know, it's one of the greatest things I've seen in reading a book is this helped me unlock the mystery of what this was. I'd searched for it for years and uh, didn't, didn't fully understand what this was talking about until he pointed this out in his book is in Revelation 17 and 18, the angel tells John, the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. When I saw that, I was like, oh, wow. What this angel's telling John, he's telling John is, John, the city, that great city of your day that reigns over the kings of the earth in your day, that is the harlot. In other words, the angel wasn't leaving John in a mystery going, okay, who is this? What am I seeing? Who is this harlot? What does this represent? The angel tells him, exactly who that harlot, is, it, that harlot is, it is Rome, the great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. It's Rome. Second, in Revelation 17, verse 9, second, the angel told John, 
And he said, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And, you know, I mentioned in, in the, in the uh, previous teaching about preterism and, or the seven mountain mandate that seven mountain teachers, some seven mountain teachers say the seven mountains are culture or here where the harlot sits. But I don't, you know, I said, I said then that's not, that's not anywhere in that scripture. That's just completely trying to uh, make that fit. But I said I would talk about it later. This is where I'm going to talk about it is the seven heads are, the, are seven mountains on which the woman sits. If you, you, you probably realize this, but Rome throughout history has been known as the city on seven hills. And so Rome clearly meets that requirement. In fact, in the first century church, is if, if they would have read Revelation 17, verse 9, they would know immediately the city on seven hills is the city of Rome. It's the great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. Even, even first century coins had the Roman goddess Roma portrayed on this, and she was sitting on, on these seven hills. And so these two context clues tells us so much about who this harlot is and who the seventh kingdom is, and well, will the Roman Empire be revived at the end of the age? It's, it's really a, a, a powerful, powerful revelation. The other thing that I, I need to point out as we get into Revelation 17 and 18, we're going to look at that in the next, se next two sessions in a lot more detail. The next thing I need to point out in Revelation 17 and 18 is that a lot of end-time teachers, they make this common mistake. I found this, they make this common mistake is they try to interpret Revelation 17 and 18 through the grid or the lens of the day in which they live. In other words, they try to say, okay, what we see in Revelation 17 and 18 is this phenomenon we see in our day. You know, like even the reformers said, okay, well, it's the Roman Catholic Church, or, you know, people now say it's the United Nations or whatever. And so the problem is, is John is seeing this woman riding on the back of the beast and this is th about three and a half years, or it's, you know, it's to actually the beginning, it's probably the beginning part of the, seven, seven, the, the last seven-year period in Daniel's 70 weeks. So it's the, the beginning of the seventh year that would uh, end Daniel's 70 weeks. And so it's the last seven years before Jesus comes back, John sees this vision in Revelation 17 and 18. So in other words, if we try to interpret Revelation 17 and 18 by looking at it through our own grid of today, we're going to miss it because it's not happened yet. It's in the future. So we got to keep that in mind. John is seeing something that's going to happen seven years before Jesus comes back. And so our interpretation must factor that in to our interpretation. Okay, so having said all of that, I know there's a lot of information. Uh, again, just... Read over the notes, listen to the teaching. If, if you need to listen to it twice or three times, just listen to it. And I would encourage you, read Daniel 2, read Daniel 7, read Revelation 17 and 18, and ask the Lord for insight and understanding. Okay, so now, why I believe Rome meets the five criteria we see here. Obviously, Rome is a real city. It's a city that already has worldwide renown. Um, it's a city that if you look on Google Maps, you can look at it and say, okay, if those were, people were in o the ocean near Rome, they could look at and see the city of Rome on fire. We also know that the Catholic Church, even though it's in the Vatican City, which is separate from Rome, it's pretty much connected to Rome, is that the Catholic Church for, for centuries has exported false religions to the nations. And the Catholic Church, you know, a lot of you know, worships Mary, worships, they adore her as the queen of heaven, who is actually a demonic world ruler. And even I, Jeremiah looked at the queen of heaven in Jeremiah 7 and Jeremiah 44 and told Israel that you're worshiping the queen of heaven. That's the very, uh, it's, Mary's a different form of that very same queen, same demonic power behind it that the Roman Catholic Church prays to and worships. So we know, and again, when I talk about the, the Catholic Church, there's millions of, I'm sure there, there's so many uh, born-again believers that are in the Catholic Church. I'm talking about the system itself, not the people in the church. I mean, there, are, there are some incredible born-again believers who love the Lord and who have been, who are just incredible followers of Jesus Christ that are part of the Catholic Church. So I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the system as a whole. And so, you, you know, throughout history is the works-based religion of Catholicism has, 
You know, Paul said very clearly, if anyone preaches another gospel than the one I preached, a, a gospel based on works, a gospel that where you have to do good works to get into heaven, a gospel that you have to do certain things and keep certain laws to get into heaven. If anyone preaches another gospel other than the one I preach, which is justification and fa by faith in Jesus Christ, he says, let him be accursed. And you know, if you studied history, the works-based religion of Catholicism is, you know, you got to do all these works to be accepted. It is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, the doctrines of demons that this, the Catholic has, Catholic Church has pushed, you know, the infallibility of the Pope, the worship of Mary, the purgatory, indulgences, the rosary, none of that can be found in Scripture. And so ever since Constantine legalized Christianity in 313 A.D., the Catholic Church has been intoxicating false religion into the nations of the earth. So that clearly, Rome meets that criteria of being a harlot that exports false religion. And finally... There's no other city in the world that comes close to Rome when it comes to blood, the blood guilt for killing Christians. There's no other city throughout history who has killed more Christians in the city of Rome. Uh, when you factor in the persecutions through the Caesars, Nero, and Domitian, their persecutions, there's no, there's no comparison that... that uh, that so many Christians have lost their lives in the, during the Roman Empire. You throw, in there the, you throw in there the Roman Colosseum, and you throw in there the Christians who were, who were sent to the wild beast and, and just ripped to pieces because they believed in Jesus Christ. Throw in there, add to that the Rome's guilt and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the death of most of the apostles. You add all of that in there, there is no other city in the earth that has more blood on their hands than the city of Rome throughout history. And so this criteria Rome meets perfectly. And so for all of these reasons, I believe that the woman who is riding that beast is the city of Rome at the end of the age. It is the revived Roman Empire right before the Antichrist destroys this empire three and a half years before Jesus comes back. So we see, let me say that again, is, is I asked the question, is I said, why is there a revived Roman Empire? If we can identify the seventh kingdom, then we can answer that, that question. To identify the seventh kingdom, we need to find it in Revelation 17 and 18. And that is found by identifying this harlot city, which I have said is, which I believe is the city of Rome. Rome is going to reach a new level. The Antichrist, when he comes to power, and it's not going to be revealed fully for who he is, he's going to, that city of Rome is going to ride on his back, so to speak, into worldwide prominence and renown. The city of Rome is going to come into a place that all of the earth looks to as the city of cities. And that's still to come in the days of head. So with all of that said, it's a mouthful, with all of that said is on page 11 in your notes, when you compare Revelation 17, 9 through 11 with Daniel 2 and 7, I've, I've got a table here that summarizes all of this together. Here's what we see. Is number one, the, the first kingdom that's mentioned is Egypt. And, and I'm talking about in Revelation 17, 9 and 11. So the first kingdom is Egypt. Daniel didn't mention Egypt. Uh, the second kingdom is Assyria. Daniel, again, did not mention Assyria. The third kingdom is Babylon, whom Daniel said was represented by the gold and the lion with eagle's wings. The fourth kingdom is Media Persia, or the Persian Empire, represented by silver and a bear. The fifth kingdom is Greece, represented by bronze and a leopard with four heads. The sixth kingdom is Rome, represented by iron and the iron monster. The seventh kingdom that we have seen in, uh, Dan, or in uh, Revelation 17 is the revived Roman Empire. And then Daniel represented this revived Roman Empire by iron and clay and by the iron monster. And then the eighth kingdom, the kingdom that comes out of the seventh kingdom is the Antichrist kingdom and the ten kings, they will rise up and they will destroy the harlot Babylon. They will destroy and burn with fire the city of Rome. And they will set up the eighth kingdom, which is the Antichrist kingdom of totalitarian regime 
where there is absolutely no mercy. It is a kingdom that is completely characterized by war and absolute control. And this Antichrist kingdom is, an, is represented again in the iron and clay kingdom in Daniel and the iron monster in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. So, that is a lot of ground, a lot of information. Um, in the next two sessions, the next, in, the, in the next session, we're going to go into a lot more detail about the details of the seventh kingdom, what it looks like, the one world government, one world religion, one world economy. And then in the, the session after that, we're going to still be focused on Revelation 17 and 18, but we're going to look at how the push for globalism over the past hundred years is actually moving us into the time when this prophecy will be fulfilled. So I, if you have questions, I just encourage you, write the questions down. You can email us. You can ask them in our uh, Forerunner School session if you want to do that. But definitely begin writing your questions down. There's a lot of information, a lot of information. But I think if you read the notes, if you read this, uh, those chapters, I think you'll, you'll be able to come to a, a, a greater clarity, an insight with understanding to understand um, how all these things work together. So thank you for listening, and uh, we'll answer some more questions in the next session.